Hey neighbor, welcome back to your local weather forecast. I'm John and this weekend we've got cloud coverage rolling in as seven singerless bands pass through, building a pattern of continuing on despite the sudden departures that could either do significant damage or reroute us to a much sunnier season. Today's video is a sequel of sorts to one I made a few years back about bands who lost a lead singer and kept going. I wanted to tap into that theme again with an emphasis on bands who not only continued with somebody new behind the mic, but bands who actually hung around and avoided imploding, with some of them unexpectedly reaching new heights even with a replacement. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please do me a favor, hit the like button, it really helps support the content, subscribe if you enjoy the episode, and check out the playlist linked below with hundreds more episodes that you'll enjoy. <laughs> This melodic metalcore group was a child of the late 90s, finding their voice with the ever-chaotic Jesse Leach, and gaining respect in their field after grinding out two tough-sounding albums before a major obstacle hit like a lightning bolt. Within months of releasing Album 2, Alive or Just Breathing, Jesse suffered from a major depressive episode as he found the lifestyle of touring and being away from his wife too much to handle. Blindsided by the news, but still sensitive to Leach's mental health, the band found a way to move forward with the phenomenal Howard Jones joining Killswitch Engage for a 10-year run, completely wiping the floor as audiences instantly connected with his intense, visceral, unrelated relenting vocal range that broke out on the successful metalcore classic as Daylight Dies. Howard was forced to relinquish his role in 2012 after a near-death experience at the hands of his type 2 diabetes. The insanity of constant studio time and touring led to him being in a coma for three days, which was essentially a wake-up call that he had to dial things back and disengage with Killswitch. With their backs against the wall, the other members held auditions for a new singer before realizing the answer was right under their nose. Noses. Bring back Jesse Leach, and that's exactly what they did, as he had used the time away from the band to heal, improve as a vocalist, and also prepare himself for extended time away on the road. I also think it's really cool that Jesse and Howard are actually close friends. There's literally no animosity or bullshit jealousy between them. In fact, Howard actually rejoined Killswitch for a face-melting banger The Signal Fire in 2019, with both of their vocal giants teaming up for one of the band's best songs ever. Floating down the sound resounds around the icy waters underground Pink Floyd are always an extremely interesting band to cover. Even if we saw this one coming from a mile away, I still think that they deserve a spot on this list. There's a very strange history around a lot of what the band did, including the fact that they lost their original singer only to fly high without him, without ever forgetting his contribution. I'm of course nodding to Sid Barrett, the man responsible for the band's name and psychedelic sound. Unfortunately, he succumbed to the very drugs that inspired him in the first place, which led to him only finishing one full record. It's their game-changing debut, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, and he eventually exited the band during the creation of Album 2. They disrupted the industry with their highly experimental brand of progressive rock, but they never forgot their founder or his psychedelic roots, even going as far as to invite him to the recording sessions for their 1975 masterpiece Wish You Were Here that included several obvious messages to Sid. Three, American heavy metal band Drowning Pool exploded with the success of their debut album Sinner in 2001 going platinum right out of the gate and gaining the band priority billings for gigs like Ozfest before their world unfortunately flipped upside down. Vocalist Dave Williams brought an unchained edge to the band, as evidenced by the insanity of their biggest hit bodies. The cruel irony of that song's title is that something very wrong was happening to Dave's own body, as the frontman was found dead on the band's tour bus in August 2002, and the death was pinned on his undiscovered heart condition, cardiomyopathy. While Drowning Pool might seem a bit more irrelevant compared to the other groups I picked, I stuck with them for the sheer willpower they've had to soldier on despite burning through two other vocalists before landing on their now permanent fixture, Jason Moreno. They still draw a decent crowd and have a following, and yeah, you could definitely argue that, oh, they're probably here for the nostalgia of albums like Sinner, but loads of their other testosterone-heavy anthems have attracted tens of millions of streams without Dave Williams. You 
could look at the metalcore outfit of Mice and Men and see a date it has been, or you could view the departure of frontman Austin Carlyle as a blessing in disguise given his questionable conduct and failing health that prevented them from touring and making records at full speed. Austin lives with a rare genetic disorder, Marfan Syndrome, that makes for a very painful existence. Even though he was the founder of the band, he exited for health reasons in 2010 only to return the next year, leading Of Mice and Men from straight up metalcore into more of a new metal hard rock direction over the course of the next three albums. Aaron Polly is the unsung hero in this story. He was originally just another lineup change that most didn't see lasting given the revolving door of members, but he stepped up to handle the clean singing in 2012 along with playing bass before finally taking the frontman reins from Austin in late 2016. They're not as big as they were, but their album Echo from 2021 sparked a renewed interest in the band thanks to big singles like Obsolete. Maybe they would have been even bigger if the spotlight had been on Austin Carlisle and he had stuck around, but for a metalcore band that saw so many changes, I would say that they defied the odds that were stacked against them. The highly successful grunge and alternative rock band Stone Temple Pilots could not catch a break when it came to their notorious frontman Scott Weiland. Long before their original frontman died in 2015, trouble brewed almost non-stop as they rose to fame in the 90s. By the release of their fantastic change of pace LP Tiny Music in 1996, Scott's addiction to heroin, cocaine, and pills had taken over Stone Temple Pilots as his primary focus, slowing the band's output significantly and putting a strain on the members' relationships. As Wyland was in and out of rehab and jail in the early 2000s, the writing on the wall came true as they unofficially broke up in 2003, only to return for one final album with Scott, their okay but definitely not great self-titled LP in 2010. STP officially kicked Wylan out of the band in 2013 due to his inability to get his shit together. Chester Bennington joined the pilots from 2013 to 2015, releasing an EP with them before stepping back to his main band Linkin Park to prioritize that. This once again left STP without a singer, but fortunately they struck gold in Jeff Gutt, a former X Factor contestant with a massive set of pipes that do justice to the original hits, and managed to be distinct enough to make their new material captivating as Stone Temple Pilots continue on 30 plus years into their career. Dance Gavin Dance are an experimental mathy post-hardcore band formed in 2005. Their off-kilter vocals have always been a fixture no matter who's doing them, and just like that, a hurricane of a career was born. Guitarist Will Swan, screamer John Mess, and drummer Matt Mingus are their backbone, having all been members since their formation. They started out with the now infamous singer Johnny Craig, a man who's done and been accused of doing so many heinous things including theft, scamming fans, hard drugs, sexual assault, you name it, this piece of shit tapeworms himself into the conversation. Unbelievably, Johnny had three stints with Gavin, 05 to 07, again from 2010 to 2012, and yet again as he returned as a touring member in 2015 and 16. After Johnny's second departure, the guys reached out to Tillian Pearson to sing cleans. He quickly joined and went full speed ahead for almost a decade of increasingly popular albums before the bottom fell out yet again on the world's unluckiest band. RIP to their bassist Tim, who passed away in early 2022, that loss was a huge one, and as if that wasn't a big enough curb stomp to Dance Gavin Dance, several very credible sexual assault allegations against Tillian Pearson broke, which led to his temporary dismissal from the band. They've now shifted their rhythm guitarist Andrew Wells to sing and scream on the upcoming tours and possibly an upcoming record. And while part of me wonders, is this all worthwhile for the band to even keep doing their thing? For them, it must be. I just have to say, maybe for the sake of the fans, after everything they've been through, bring back Kurt Travis. Any fan of Genesis can't help but see the faint writing in the fog on the mirror. Okay, we had two incredible singers, but am I team Phil Collins or team Peter Gabriel? Genesis is one of those rare stories where it all worked out, both artistically, commercially, all that good stuff that you don't normally get when a longtime frontman steps away. Peter Gabriel was a majestic figure boasting a coat of many colors. 
He was a natural showman on stage, much to the annoyance of his bandmates, but his flair for unforgettable melodies and eccentric performances and even eclectic instrument usage made for an exceptional eight-year, six-album run. For a minute there, it seemed as though they'd lost themselves. Maybe this was the Book of Revelation Genesis Edition. A reluctant Phil Collins, the band's drummer, eventually agreed to take on singing duties after none of the vocalist auditions felt like the right fit. At first, they kind of stuck with the progressive rock style they were known for. That was until the 80s hit, and accusations of them selling out breathed down their back like a micromanaging boss. I'm not even the biggest Genesis fan to begin with, but the Peter Gabriel years take the cake easily. If you're looking for some recommendations, maybe you're only aware of the 80s hits, I do recommend checking out some of their 70s output, even the proggier stuff they did with Collins, but my personal favorite is probably Selling England by the Pound. Cheers to another episode of 7 on Sunday. There's a whole playlist on screen if you're hungry for more, or you can tap here for the most recent one. Please hit that like button on your way out, subscribe, and make sure you turn on notifications too. YouTube is super finicky with that stuff. Thanks for watching. Peace.